Hello, I'm Charlie Brooker and you're watching Weekly Wipe, a programme all about things that are happening. Things like this. The contaminated beef scandal continues to deepen. It turns out some Findus lasagnas may have had more horse in them than Catherine the Great. As angry consumers blame the government, David Cameron promises he's going to get a firm grip on your meat. The Pope gives up poping for Lent. Many are shocked. You're jogging. The Pope. Oh, my God. A furious god shocked the Vatican and in startling scenes hurled a rock at the planet in response to the Pope stepping down. Or maybe he's just angry about gay marriage. It's hard to tell with God. He's ever so weird. Meanwhile, this roof indicates Barclays will elect the new Pope. And in astonishing scenes, David Beckham forgets his kit and is forced to do his thrilling new advert in his pants. That is the kind of thing that's been happening. But we start here. I don't know about you, but when I ate a burger, I used to think, hmm, what a tasty compacted disc of mint tissue scrapings blasted off a cow carcass with a high-pressure hose and a fly-blown abattoir ringing with the incoherent, agonised howls of simple beasts dying from a single bolt gun shot to the forehead. But now it turns out it might not have been as appetising as that. Good evening. Supermarket shelves are being cleared of frozen burgers tonight after reports that some contain DNA from horses. A few weeks ago, the news went a bit silent witness Tesco edition as cheap burgers were being illegally cut with horse. Being caught out flogging a dead horse was bad publicity for Tesco. Many of us don't want to eat horse. We're not barbarians. Although barbarians are precisely the people Tesco apparently used to choose produce for their customers, as their alarming new ad campaign makes clear. No, that's the last time you're going to see that falcon, unless you pick up some meatballs on the way out. Obviously, you can't trust flipping Conan here to possibly tell the difference between a cow and a horse. I mean, look, he probably thinks that avocado's a dragon's egg. Mind you, you never know what weird mash-up food you're going to get in Tesco. Those were probably laid by a horse. Bet that melon's full of pig guts, and f*** knows how you make tiger loaf. And it wasn't just horse rearing up unexpectedly. It was also revealed some halal prison food contained an insulting amount of pig. Halal meat eaters were as stunned as halal cows aren't. But the steady gallop of nasty food stories was about to become a stampede, as the top story basically became... Ugh. The horse meat scandal deepens. Findus lasagnas have been found to contain up to 100% horse meat. 100% horse meat? That is a complete mare. By now, the revelations were piling up like mangled horses at Beecher's Brook, and the news was full of more pink, meaty, glistening close-up shots than a year's subscription to Penthouse, as well as upsetting testimony from members of the public dismayed to discover they may have unwittingly noshed off a horse. For Alfie Green, beef lasagna was a tea-time favourite. Not anymore. So, will you be eating any more of these? No, not no more, we won't. Definitely not. Oh, come on, let's not be too hasty. Don't go mad, you'll miss out on this kind of gourmet experience. Mmm! Ah, oh, I bet your mouth's watering at home. <laughs> to discuss the grim scandal, Sky paraded a paddock full of food experts on screen, some of whom did their best to lighten the distressing news by describing the crisis in the voice of Ronnie Corbett. Well, what's supposed to happen is that the supermarket checks on your behalf. Supermarkets are the experts in food. You know what? He may sound funny, but he really knows the food chain. No, we talk about the food chain and... Um... At one end, meat comes out, but and cows normally go in. Uh, but there's somewhere in the food chain, horses came in and meat came out. This guy is good. This whole thing has been a PR disaster for Findus, which is a shame because their lasagnas always look really nice in the lovingly shot adverts. I mean, look at that, no hooves sticking out of it or anything. That's it, son. Eat your horse. Giddy up. In the pre-horse meat scandal days, Findus used to run an impressively chic advert for their gourmet range. Created by a suave French chef. Candles, wine, music, and the secret weapon. A recipe from Jean-Christophe Novelli himself. Yes, Jean-Christophe Novelli used to be the credible face of Findus Lasagna, prepping the food in a notably horseless kitchen. Wonder if he's ever used horse? I mean, I'm sure if he has, he only used the finest quality Parisian horse. Created by me, frozen by Finder. And ridden by jockeys. Uh, we've been asked to point out that Jean-Christophe Novelli has in no way been implicated in the horse meat scandal. 
Of course, thanks to television, we've become accustomed to seeing food prepared in picturesque kitchens like this, whereas as Sky News starkly depicted, Findus lasagnas are actually made in places like this. In fact, rather than friendly Findus, they're actually manufactured by the less appetising sounding Comigel, who supply lovingly mass-produced frozen dead animal gobble pots for companies all over Europe. The trail of suspect meat being detailed on the news like a map from invasion of the edible horse creatures. In fact, thanks to the charming accompanying footage we've seen of the depressing interiors of food processing plants, the whole thing is starting to feel uncomfortably close to the plot of the superbly depressing 70s dystopian epic Soylent Green, in which Charlton Heston discovers processed food is being manufactured from the corpses of recently euthanised people. If I was the food industry, which I'm not, I'd actually turn the uncertainty over what's in our meat into a plus. I'd market it as the safari in your mouth burger. It's an entire animal kingdom in a bun. Who knows what you're going to get? It could be cow, pig, horse, meerkat, or all of the above. The horse meat scandal has generated much discussion, some of it online, as we'll see now. These are your words, your opinions, it's what you think. It's points off of you in points off you. The news that horse meat has been found in beef products has made many people very angry. For instance, Muso felt driven to visit Yahoo to ponder, I wonder who has been tampering with it? I think we might find out it's related to immigrants. Hmm, I think you'll find the horses were immigrants, Romanian immigrants at that, coming over here taking British cows' jobs. Food Minister David Heath popped up all over the news to reassure consumers, urging them not to needlessly throw meat away. A sentiment that annoyed Sam, who went to the BBC News site to say, how dare the government tell us what we can and cannot do? If I want to bin meat, that is my choice, my right. I'm half tempted to ruin lots of meat to make a point. Hmm, well, good luck with that, Sam. Although I'd say you'd be hard pressed to make the point any more cogently than you just did. The BAFTAs were held on Sunday, which made for glittering and exciting viewing. Helen Mirren shocked and stunned everyone watching with a snazzy new pink hairdo. Her new hairstyle prompted much discussion. For instance, E went on to Yahoo to say, my kid's primary school headmistress had pink flashes in her white blonde hair, and she was a mature lady. She was a fantastic headmistress and led the way with her mantra in a multicultural school that everyone was special, individual creativity was applauded, and there was no school uniform. The school had excellent discipline and great results. School uniforms stifle individuality and creativity. Food for thought there. Although I'm not sure it's entirely relevant to the topic under discussion here. Thank you anyway. P, meanwhile, similarly expressed admiration for Helen's hair, stating simply, defo worth a bang. Oh, P, you are a card. The One Show usually has these guests, like someone off Waterloo Road or a bloke who knows shitloads about the history of tarmac. But the other day, there was this bald bloke on and I was across the room and I thought, oh, it's Jesper Carrot. Maybe they're doing golden balls again. But it wasn't Jesper Carrot, it was Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis, right, had done this film called A Good Day to Die Hard, and it had this brilliant trailer full of like, amazing things happening, like explosions and more explosions, which is brilliantly done. All the fire looks hot and everything. Hardly anyone seemed to have seen this Die Hard 5 thing till just before it came out. It was like the film people were keeping it secret, so no one could spoil it for you by saying, hey, it's brilliant, just before you pay to see it. But Matt Baker and Alex Jones had seen it, and they obviously loved it because they kept telling Bruce Willis it was great. And it is absolutely incredible. Thank you. You've raised the bar as far as action movies are concerned. Bruce Willis seemed sort of humble about how good he knew the film was. Like, he could hardly talk about it, it was so humble. And uh, it has that, that die-hard off to it, so... Seriously, he was so torn up with pride, he just had to look at the floor and hardly say anything. Like, when they asked if his daughters had seen it. Have the girls seen the film? Uh, you didn't... Like, you could see in his eyes he was really proud of this film. The exciting-looking film where he machine guns all the terrorists for, like, the fifth time, which looks brilliant. He's managed to make the same film five times without dying on the inside or looking like he doesn't really have much enthusiasm for the whole fucking thing anymore and just wishes it would stop. That's not what he looks like. Matt Baker, right, introduced a clip from Moonlighting, and you could tell Bruce was excited. A lot of Moonlight. people will remember you from uh, Moonlighting back oh. in uh, 85. Yeah, it it kind of launched you, didn't it? Let's just remind ourselves mm. for all those that may have forgotten. Here we go. <gasps> Moonlighting looked brilliant, sort of effervescent, like full of life. 
but not as good as the new film that looks amazing with all the stuff that blows up and, and the exciting shooting and everything and all the computerised pictures where everything explodes and, and the big writing and the banging and the booming sounds. <laughs> In terms of noise alone, it's probably the best film ever. Later, they mentioned Bruce's singing career when he did Under the Boardwalk, and he was chuffed they brought that up. You should Enjoy. sing Under the Boardwalk. Oh, well, yeah. They showed a bit of it, actually, all that entertaining footage of him singing these classic songs in front of some black blocks in the 80s. It was great. <laughs> Not as great as the film he's done that looks really incredible with all the helicopters and the death in it, obviously, because that's amazing. Then he sort of made a sound with a harmonica and got a nice round of applause. Oh. <laughs> and I thought, oh, he must have overcome something. That's why they're being nice. Good for you, Bruce. Hope the film makes loads of money. I really do, because it looks good, that film, with all the amazing explosions and, and the shooting in it and, and the helicopter and everything. And, and then him killing people, like really killing lots of people with guns, like people with mums and dads and histories. And he just mows them all down because they're sort of bad, probably. I don't know, I haven't seen it. But I expect they are, otherwise he's a fucking murderer. I always thought all marriages were same-sex marriages. After all, married couples end up having the same sex over and over again until it's as emotionally involving as flossing your teeth. So on the face of it, the thought of two people with matching ghoulies walking down the aisle seems about as controversial as, I don't know, two people who are quite into Game of Thrones getting married. But apparently, it's a bit more controversial than that. The recent Commons vote on same-sex marriages exposed ructions in the Tory party as the modernisers went up against the traditionalists. I say traditionalists, but the traditional argument has actually changed. The traditional argument against anything gay used to be, Ugh, bummers, oh, I don't like it. I mean, not so long ago, even the BBC could openly express that attitude. For many of us, this is revolting, men dancing with men. That is revolting. They'll be too tired to f each other afterwards. But today's modern progressive traditionalists accept the notion of gay sex, as long as it's not in their backyard or rammed down their throat, and a handful of them repeatedly popped up on the news to explain their opposition to gay marriage is nothing to do with bedroom squeamishness, no. It's uh, to do with other issues, such as timing. I mean, why now, when there are more important issues? It's not the priority. The economy's the priority. In 26 years as an MP, I never once got a letter calling for gay marriage. Oh, that's a shame. You're quite a good-looking bloke. I'd marry you. Another objection widely voiced across the news is that this is an attempt to redefine marriage. The significant number in his party will not support what they see as an attempt to redefine marriage. We are changing the definition of marriage, a redefinition of marriage. We begin to live in sort of Alice in Wonderland. We begin to things, make things topsy-turvy. We begin to redefine language. Hmm, it's an interesting philosophical point, but surely if I choose to redefine a spoon as something I shove up my ass, it doesn't stop you enjoying your pudding unless I use your spoon. But perhaps the biggest objection widely voiced across the news is that David Cameron simply doesn't have a mandate for this kind of thing. Neither the Prime Minister nor any of the other party leaders has a mandate. There's no mandate for this at all. There's no mandate. No mandate. No mandate. He has got no mandate. No mandate. No mandate. No mandate? Well, if Cameron's got no mandate, maybe he can borrow some from Sasha Distel. Hello, I am Sasha Distel. They asked me to try mandate and now I wear it all the time because it's sophisticated, long-lasting and very sexy. This is the picture. This time it's for real. Mandate sings my songs. Not just a fun thing, like some kiss and run thing, forever was part of it. Mandate speaks my language. Yes, as this masculine and evocative ad artfully demonstrates, Mandate is the sole reserve of heterosexuals. And when I'm relaxing, need I say more? It's all right, see my wife. Oh, thank God for that. I thought it was your husband. And you don't have a mandate for that, you mucky Frenchman. Mandate says a lot for a man. Anyway, that's the anti-camp. Not that I'm calling them camp. What about the pro-gay body? Typically, the pinko leftist, liberal, lefty, communist, left-wing media was doing its bit to promote diversity by showing us gay couple after gay couple. 
We saw gay couples so laid back they seemed to be feeding their baby to a dog. We saw a gay couple so close they could finish each other's sentences. And we looked to, to upgrade to marriage from a civil union simply because because we want to have the same equality as everybody else. Gay marriage looks fun. And a gay couple that resembled the most progressive ventriloquist act of all time. It's a thing of almost a civil partnership isn't good enough to be a marriage. And even we have this conversation a lot with people and we say, we're getting married. Thing is, all these gay couples look alike to me. I mean, look at this gay couple. Why should we not be equal to anybody else? Just the same as this gay couple. People say gay marriage. It isn't gay marriage, it's just marriage. And this gay couple. It's about dignity for lesbian and gay people. I thought they liked diversity. They all look the same. Even Hugh Edwards doesn't seem to think they're all that. You've got a stable relationship, five kids. Well, what's the big deal? Of course, it's not just MPs who take a view on gay marriage, other humans do too. The new Archbishop of Canterbury, seen here passing his initiation test by pointing to where God lives, is opposed to it. Whereas this northern fisherman thinks it's fine. My brother was gay, so I'm only, I'm, I don't object to it, and I loved him. This guy doesn't believe in it. Based on my Christian beliefs, um, I don't agree with uh, gay marriages at all. And some couples aren't that impressed, actually, are they, love? We're not that impressed, actually. Are we, love? Oh, marriage. As the pink Mageddon vote approached, the news cameras were pointing at the Commons. With the gay floodgates about to open, traditional values were already slipping. Trendy progressive Channel 4 News sent Alex Thompson to cruise for reaction live from a gay bar with a pint in his hand. We're live in a Soho bar. Yes, we're in the Rupert Street Bar in central London where we'll be talking to gay men and getting their reaction. Finally, after all the debate, the MPs cast their vote. Tonight at 10, plans to allow gay couples to marry have been approved by MPs. And then the vote passed, thereby paving the way for same-sex unions and causing the world to end, which is why you didn't see this. Love in all its guises can be terribly complex, but what better way to contemplate love than via the medium of poetry? Here's topical poet Tim Key. This is a poem about love. I'm in love with a girl. But I'll never have her. I will never have her. Or at least it's statistically unlikely. Because she is extremely pretty. And because I only saw her on the telly in the crowd at the US Open. She looked like she had a fella. She was had her hand on a fella's leg. Love can be a little bit... a little bit of a fucker. We don't trust the human heart to make romantic decisions on its own anymore, and why should we now we've got technology? These days, people meet using online dating algorithms, they flirt over Twitter, swap mucky photos via 4G, and have full sexual intercourse with microwave ovens. They absolutely do. But TV isn't quite as sophisticated as that. It tries to pair people off using sheer weight of numbers alone. Consider the phenomenal Take Me Out, which opens with Paddy McGuinness sliding down a pipe like a cheeky showbiz turd before summoning 30 girls into our dimension via a kind of instant hen night dispenser. It's a simple test to see if they can navigate stairs, which they don't always pass. <laughs> why you? Because there's no God, that's why you. There's no God and we're all gonna die, okay? You happy now? Get on with your dating show. Hope you meet someone nice. The titted jury then assumes the position behind 30 neon podiums in scenes resembling a Baz Luhrmann remake of the Nuremberg Trials. Then McGuinness delivers his trademark Let the X See the Y catchphrase. Let the Saturday night see the fever. <laughs> Next, a mammal is delivered down the chute and encouraged to perform basic tricks for the girls to scrutinise. My name's William and I'm from Carmarthen. The jurors then make yes or no snap judgments based on their appearance. The hive mind is displeased by your boldness. They're also shown backstory VT, so even those who've been defeated by stairs can judge the men's lifestyle. I'm really lucky as I'm a professional footballer, getting paid to play is unbelievable. I can't think of anything worse than a footballer. <laughs> 
What about a footballer up some stairs? Less popular is Sky's existentially terrifying love machine, fronted by barking obelisk Chris Moyles and Peggy from Heidi High. Impossibly, it's actually less intellectually nourishing than Take Me Out and establishes itself from the very start as a show for the easily pleased. Hello and welcome to the Love Machine on Sky Living HD. Look at Stacey Sullivan, everybody. Thank you, that's our level calibrated. You may now proceed. The love machine of the title resembles a sort of gigantic phone dial from which choosy contestants pick potential shags while the audience moves encouragement. Since the prospective f**ks aren't allowed to speak during the selection process, it looks exactly like what'll happen in the near future when you can go into a sex android showroom to choose this year's model. I don't like his jacket. OK. Oh, do you know what? He can always take it off. It's not sellotape to him. It's, it's, in, it's in my mind now. I won't forget it. Both his ears pierced, is that... Any opinion about that? It's a bit too much for me, that. You're not feeling it, are you? I'm sorry, no. If they decide they actually like the look of one... Yeah, he's fit. Oh, OK! Ooh. That's good. The genitals humanoid in question is downloaded from the machine for a closer look. Hey, he stood in front of you. He picked about the wheel. He's good height as well. <laughs> yeah. You know what? This is actually a more rigorous meat inspection than the food standards agencies managed recently. The love machine's hardly scientific. You'd probably have about as much chance of producing a mate by holding a karaoke contest and copping off with whoever had the best voice. Fortunately, there's a show where exactly that happens too. This is Sing Date, where people look for love by singing to each other. Why? Sing Date is yet another weird televised method of choosing a life partner. In it, a music-mad singleton sifts through a stack of videos of other music-mad singletons crooning into their laptops like hostages forced to entertain their captors at gunpoint. It's time to start Joy's search for love. On the Sing Date site, a medley of men are ready to serenade her. There's no need to... Where is he? He looks like he's in some kind of a closet. They then choose three potential suitors from the crap heap. Joy's first choice is Stuart. Stuart was quite interesting, actually. Um, he, he was very clean cut. I love the way he danced. It's a very, very good voice indeed. And I love his movements. And I just think he'd be just so much fun. They then perform a live duet with each of them in turn to see if it sparks love. I know this love we share was meant to be. I knew you were waiting. I knew you were waiting. I knew you were waiting. I knew you were waiting for me. Then she has to pick one, just one, based on the sound of their voice and whatever decor she can spot in the background, before inviting them into the studio for the grand finale, in which they serenade each other in scenes which closely resemble a sort of amateur restaging of a Top of the Pops 2 clip from 1989. Endless love. That'd be great to sing with, I tell you. <laughs> Joining me to discuss dating shows like Sing Date are stand-up Tony Law and comedian Richard Herring, who sings, sings in women's faces during sex. Isn't that true? <laughs> I've been known to do that. What yeah. did you make of, of Sing Date? I don't like singing. No. At all. Full stop. No, I, I like if you go see a band or something where they're supposed to be singing, but people who just break into song can't bear that. But it's like singing has become the most important thing. It's the X factor if you can sing in that yeah. sort of karaoke way. It's not like singing, it's singing in a certain type of way. So if you can sing like that, you become very rich and now you get to have, go on dates with people. Whereas if you can't sing, you're not allowed to have sex anymore. I mean, presumably the idea is that they think musical couplings always work, mm. unlike, say, Rihanna and Chris Brown or, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, or Phil Spector and the woman he shot. Um, <laughs> Although, in the programme, the two people who got together were really ideal for each other. They and were. I am utterly convinced they went straight home and had sex with each other, so... Do and are together now, I think. If you think singing is an unusual way to choose a partner, have a look at this. This is a new American show called The Choice. Uh, as the title suggests, it's a bit like The Voice. Celebrity bachelors select a potential partner on the sound of her voice alone. Hey, guys. So, first and foremost, I can assure you that I am the best. Is that right? Yeah. I am an East Coast girl at heart, but I currently live in Sin City, Nevada. I am a cocktail server on the Las Vegas Strip. I love to party. Ten seconds and have a good time. I... Obviously, everyone in that looks uniquely loathsome. <laughs> um, uh, what did you make of that? Well, the men are all really famous, right? Mm. And they're the last people and, and very rich and quite sort of good-looking and single. Mm. The last thing those blokes need 
is a dating show to get them more women. They're already getting plenty. It's like they're too lazy to go out and just go to a bar. They're so, too lazy even to do that, yeah. even to dangle themselves out there like <laughs> a maggot in a pond. I'm a professional poker player. <laughs> To be honest, it doesn't take that much to convince men. They no. might as well say something like, my vagina isn't full of bees. <laughs> or even, my vagina is no longer full of bees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But also, all the women are identical anyway. Well, that is the um, thing. I mean, it is all sort of fairly identical, hot, yeah. America, hot American women. There's no there jeopardy, that's hot, what I said. There isn't any jeopardy. Hot, damaged American women <laughs> in cocktail dresses <laughs> who haven't ended up in porn then go on this show. Oh, this, this is the rung above porn. Yeah. I'd feel more comfortable if the game was completely reversed, though. What if you did a show called Glory Hole? <laughs> yeah. And someone has to stick their penis through, yeah. and whoever's on the other, it could be it could be a woman, it could be a goat, it could be your dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Be... And that's it. You guys are going on a date. Yeah. And you have I know to... what dad's like, so <laughs> I'd probably be an OK I'm date. Oh, great. I love dad's favourite <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There was this king bloke called Richard III who died ages ago and no one knew where he was. But then they found him again. He'd been hiding in the ground, which kings don't normally do. There was this really interesting thing all about it, sort of like CSI, but in Leicester. And with this man from Horrible Histories and a woman who's in love with King Richard, even though he's dead like Demi Moore and Ghost, it was brilliant. It's all quite clinical, isn't it, all sort of laid it's out It's very like clinical. This. It's really it's difficult for seeing him mm. laid out like this. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't... <laughs> People kept saying he died on the battlefield, but he didn't. He died in a car park. And the car park's only open Monday to Friday, so he must have died on a weekday. In the old paint photos, King Richard had sort of dog ears, but those had all rotted away. He turned into all bones. You could see he was like half human, half dinosaur. Because they had his skull, they could make his whole head and show exactly what his eyebrows looked like and whether he plucked them or not. Because you can tell that from a skull. What's weird is the likeness that they made looks like what they thought he would have looked like anyway, but that just shows how accurate the plasticine stuff is. This is an historic moment in the story of Leicester. It's really put Leicester on the map. The only person they'd found there before was Gary Lineker, but his skeleton's still in his body, and he only spends some of his time in car parks. Nutrition and a yoghurt company employs shocking emotional blackmail to shift units. Last year, my mum fell badly. <laughs> she was stuck at home for months. <laughs> She knew calcium was important, so I thought she was taking good care of her bones. Your mum took care of my bone. I just didn't get it. Your mum did. But what I've just learned is that vitamin D is also very important on top. It helps the body absorb and use calcium. Oh, that's a good graph. I mean, look at that. That is exactly how vitamin D works. It really made me think. Yeah, it made you think, I'll use mum's accident to flog some f***ing yoghurt. And in a tempestuous time for supermarkets, Tesco withdraws horse-contaminated burgers, Aldi is tainted by Dobbin-flavoured lasagna, and in harrowing and surprising scenes, Morrison's meat counter suffers a terrible ant infestation. Hi, Anthony. Can I call you Anthony? You certainly can. Have you seen that knife? I'd call him sir. Good point. The food is lovingly presented, and Ant and Dec come across as likeably as ever, but they're an odd choice, really, to front a food campaign. There you go. I've scored it for you. Just rubbing some salt for some lovely crackling. I mean, the last time I saw them on television cheerfully encouraging someone to eat something, it wasn't quite such an appetising scene. <laughs> it's deep-fried camel bear. Camel penis. Yes, I'm a celebrity doesn't look quite so gut-wrenching now we've all been eating unidentified creature. Get it down your neck, it's hardly a Findus lasagna. Oh. Disgusting. Well, that's about all we've got time for this week. I hope you can handle that. Until next time, go away. Go away.